Uh, well, these days we hear a fair amount of the phrase contested Republican National Convention. What does that mean? And just the uh, overall race for president on both sides isn't uh, leading down just yet to a single candidate on either side. So we'll talk a little bit about that right now with WMU's Peter Wheelhauer, a professor of political science, who's back with us again this morning. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Richard. Thank you, sir, for the time, as usual. My pleasure. Let's just start with an overall uh, impression of your uh, thoughts as it relates to the race in general right now. We still have a, a field of candidates out there. Well, we do, but it really, from a practical standpoint, has been narrowed down on the Republican side to Cruz and uh, Trump. And uh, on the Democratic side, I mean, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are still going at it, hammer and tong, but uh, it looks like uh, it's possible that they, they won't have a majority of pledged delegates by the time they go into their convention either, uh, leaving it in the hands of the superdelegates. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Republicans don't have superdelegates, and so there are all kinds of other things at play in that process. Well, let's talk about what that means. Uh, let's talk about what delegates means, because... I see these opportunities when we chat as a, as a chance to get people more involved in the process who may not have paid attention at all. What does delegates mean? So uh, each party has a set of rules in order to uh, win the party's nomination for the presidency. Uh, each delegate, a, a candidate has to win a majority of the delegates from that party's national convention. So the Republicans have uh, roughly 2,500 delegates. Uh, the Democrats have roughly 4,500 delegates, and so a winning candidate has to somehow cobble together uh, about, uh, a majority of those delegates at the convention in order to secure the nomination. The primary processes, the primaries and the caucuses, are one stage of that, of that process in which uh, delegate numbers are roughly assigned. Um, and then uh, a second stage of the process is actually selecting who will be those individuals who become the state delegates to the convention. Mm -hmm. So they essentially represent the voters and go to the convention as those representatives. That's correct. Yeah, in most of the places, so for example, in the Michigan primary, uh, the results of the, uh, of the uh, primary were, were based upon the votes that were cast and how things were distributed how those votes were distributed in the uh, congressional districts across the state. And then um, those individuals, though, who actually end up going to the Cleveland Convention are not selected at that time. They're selected at a, at a later date. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those actually, I think, uh, I think were selected at the Republican uh, State Convention this past weekend. Now, when we come back in a minute, we'll talk about what a contested convention means and uh, how that shakes out if it were to happen. That's when we come right back on WBCK. Peter Wheelhauer is here from the WMU Poli Sci Department. We're talking about uh, the election and what a contested convention might look like, and we'll uh, get to that here in a second. So our point was that when you go to the primary and you uh, choose your candidate, you're actually assigning delegates to go to the convention for you and uh, follow through on that. And that's, is that what, a, uh, what an uncontested convention then would be? Is that a fair way to put it, Peter? Well, I think the uncontested convention might best be understood by thinking about um, candidates who actually achieve that majority of delegates that they need. They go to the convention, for example, almost all of the conventions nowadays, um, you have a candidate, one candidate who receives the majority of those delegates, so it's not really uh, in conflict who the nominee is going to be when the parties get to their convention. What we have this year, with the Republicans in particular, is a situation where it looks like it's unlikely uh, or going to be very difficult for Donald Trump, for example, to achieve that uh, majority of delegates that he needs. So you get to the convention, nobody has a majority, and then you have a set of rules that are in play for how to cast those votes and how to res eventually resolve the, uh, the conflict over who the nominee is going to be. Mm -hmm. And how do they do that? Well, there are a number of ways of doing this. Um, so uh, this is a multi-stage process. You have the individuals who are uh, the delegates that are there, and then you have the rules committee, which is elected by the state delegation. So, for example, the Michigan delegate uh, delegation then elects who their uh, representatives would be to the rules committee, and the rules committee 
nails down the specific rules for how the convention is going to be run. On wow. the first ballot, uh, pretty much all the delegates are uh, have to cast their votes as they're originally pledged. There are a handful of unbound delegates that are free to vote however they want to. That's a relatively small number. Right now it's only about 20 or so. Um, on the second ballot, though, if uh, nobody's got a majority on the first ballot, then about 60% of the delegates that are out, they get unbound and they can vote the way they want to. And that's where you really start to see the groundwork ahead of time having made a difference huh. because then because what's going on right now is that the cruise campaign is working on the individuals who will be actually be going to the convention trying to get those delegates to be favorable toward them on that second ballot vote i see so yeah it becomes a uh, situation where any of those candidates uh, any of the three could um, be the choice by those unbound delegates then Yes, and so here's where that individual level of organization and building personal relationships really matters a lot. Um, now, Donald Trump will need fewer delegates in order to hit that majority on a second ballot if that happens. The problem is that he doesn't have very good relationships with people in the, in the party, and so uh, he has been kind of late getting to the process of influencing the individuals who actually show up in Cleveland, whereas the Cruz campaign, understanding from the beginning that this is how the system works, uh, has been cultivating those relationships. And, and from all accounts in terms of the media and political pundits, seem to be way ahead of Trump in terms of consolidating that second round set of votes. But we still have time to change that. We do have time to change that, but um, the the we have two things that could be changing here. First, the Republican electorates themselves could eventually give Trump the nomination outright. Mm -hmm. He needs right now about 66% of the remaining delegates. Um, that's nowhere near where he's been earning. He's been earning about 45% of the delegates per state. So that seems like an uphill climb for him. Uh, the second part of that is uh, really getting a handle on what the exact rules are uh, at the convention. Boy, uh, you presume that the rules are clear ahead of time. But what you're saying is there's some wiggle room. Well, the rules are are, are murky. Uh, we have the, the the kinds of rules that people have been talking about here are really the rules that have been standing since 2012, but those rules are susceptible to change, and it's it, that's not a new thing. I mean, they can be changed every year. They changed them in 2012 uh, at the uh, at or near the convention, uh, based on what they had been in 2008. So this is not a new thing, but understanding that the rules committee matters. Uh, makes a big difference in terms of setting yourself up for a favorable playing field once you get to uh, the convention. We're talking with Professor Peter Wheelhauer about a contested convention for the Republicans. We'll uh, finish that thought in a second and talk about what uh, the dynamic is like on the Democrat side as well. We're talking with Professor Peter Wheelhauer about the idea of a contested convention for the Republicans, the overall dynamic here. Uh, that uh, tends to uh, favor, in some circles, anti-establishment candidates. And, you know, I guess that's a worthy point here. So, you know, the, the technical parts of this that we've been describing in terms of delegates and getting the majority and the glad-handing that Cruz seems to be handling better than Trump in presuming there might be a contested convention, you still have the dynamic, though, of the public in the general election. And that's got to complicate this, too. It sure does, and I think that's a good point. You know, I always try to communicate to my students that uh, in, in the classes that it's if you want to understand politics and the way politicians work, you have to understand the rules of the game. When somebody knows the rules, they can leverage those rules to their advantage. And this is where Cruz really seems to be playing the game better than Donald Trump. That said, Donald Trump has a more uh, effective political message because his campaign is really premised on anger and frustration within the Republican Party against the Republican establishment. So it's like the, you've got these rules that are set up by the establishment, and Trump is really against the establishment rules. And so it kind of works in his favor. The question, as you, as you alluded to, is what happens in the general election? Does that same kind of anger that we see within the Republican base and within the Democratic base, uh, does that same kind of anger translate to the broader public that are not really all that 
connected to either party, mm -hmm. but are just kind of looking at the overall system. Are right. they frustrated enough to um, vote for a an angry candidate over an establishment candidate? For example, Donald Trump over a Hillary Clinton. It's not clear that that's the way things would break. Right. And, you know, for example, with, with the Republican side, you know, Trump leading in a fair amount of areas, or at least in the polls, if suddenly he's not the nominee, does that disenfranchise those voters and they don't fall in line behind uh, Cruz, let's say, that's the nominee? Yeah, I think that's an important question. If, if Donald Trump comes really close, say within a couple of dozen delegates, and then doesn't get the nomination, I think the Republican Party really risks uh, alienating his supporters for the general election. If he's still a couple of hundred away, which is entirely possible, then I think that the, that they've got, the party itself has a better position in kind of overruling that plurality hmm. of Republican delegates. All right. Now, on the other side, there's a little bit of that same sentiment, isn't there? I mean, I, I've heard some Bernie fans say they, they can't get excited about Hillary. So she's leading, but will they fall in line if she's the nominee? Well, I think that there's a there are two ways to look at this. One is for them to look at the general election outcome. Let's say it's a Hillary Clinton versus a Donald Trump, and people who now are Bernie Sanders um, fans and ardent supporters saying that they won't vote for Hillary Clinton, but when they get to the when they get to go vote, if they choose to vote, they're going to be faced with this choice. And mm -hmm. certainly, you know, Clinton would be a better choice for them ideologically than Clint than Trump would be even if they would have to hold their nose in order to vote for her. Right. The big question for the Clinton campaign is, and the Democratic Party generally is whether they can get those people to the polls. If, if Bernie Sanders voters don't vote, that's a different problem than they're saying we'll vote for somebody like Jill Stein, who's the, the Green Party candidate, mm -hmm. who's a, who's got a, who could be a, a viable option for them, even though she couldn't win the presidency. Right. So they would just do it as a... A matter of uh, principle, yeah, in, in their minds. So it's not then really about the staunch Republicans or the staunch Democrats. It's about the people in the middle. Once we get to get past the conventions and we finish these primary processes, you'll see both candidates, whoever the end seems to have an advantage. Um, so let's say Hillary Clinton, you will see her very quickly once she gets to that, that, that sweet spot with regard to delegates you will quickly see her pivot to start attacking Republicans more generally. Sure. She's already doing that to a lesser extent. She can't completely focus on the Republicans, but she's she's kind of making that move. The Republicans are going to have to wait longer to um, hone their sights in on, on the Democratic nominee because they're still working their system trying to resolve this problem of who's going to be the nominee uh, through midsummer. And so um, this this ability to move to the general election mindset uh, gives the Democrats uh, more of an advantage here than it does to the Republicans. Has there been a contested convention recently? I don't think there has. The most recent contested convention uh, was for the Democrats in 1952. Uh, that produced Adlai Stevenson. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, it was the Republicans in 1948. Now, in 1976, Gerald Ford did not have a majority of delegates heading at the end of the primary process, but he had consolidated support enough that by the time they got, actually got to the convention, he had secured support of a majority. So there was really a contested race. Um, interestingly, the, both, uh, both of the major candidates, uh, and maybe even John Kasich as well on the Republican side, uh, they've hired old people. And they, they've hired people who actually were active back in 1948 mm. uh, to try to figure out uh, what exactly is the process of navigating these rules. It was a really different process back then. It was a brokered convention back in those days. That's when you had people at the top of the party who really were able to manipulate the whole system and, and force changes. Uh, the, that system is gone, mm. but the basic principle of how you work up a convention, uh, I think... Uh, that's basic politics, right? And I think that they're they're both trying to do the best they can to figure out how to work that system. All right. We're out of time. We'll have to leave it there. Something will happen in the next 10 minutes. Probably we'll have a whole new set of questions, and I'll call you again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Professor Peter Wheelhauer, WMU Poli-Sci Department on WBCK.